Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. And good morning. Good morning to you all. And welcome. We are, we are in the middle of going through the book of Colossians. If this is your first time uh, joining us, uh, welcome. And if you are joining our study online, Welcome. You have some, some catching up to do if you are just starting uh, because we are in the third chapter of Colossians. And what we did or what we have done is that we covered all the way to verse 17 of the third chapter. Now, uh, that was kind of like a bird's eye view of what the Word of God has to say concerning how Christians should live, or at least that s small portion, that beginning portion of it. We talked about how we are to react to worldly impulses, that we are to be dead to them. The whole point was that corpses do not react to stimuli. So if you are dead to sin, it means that when temptation comes or sin comes knocking at your door, you don't even answer and say nobody's home. You just don't answer. Uh, my father, um, I remember one time he got very angry with me, but my mother was quite amused because there was somebody who wanted him, called, and I answered the phone, and he did one of these to me, and I said, my father says he's not here. <laughs> so he snatched the phone from me and, and, and had to have the conversation he did not want to have. My mother was quite amused at that. Uh, but yes, if I was dead, I would not have been able to answer that way. So the whole idea is that corpses do not react. And so... That's what we were talking about uh, last week, and that, if, uh, that we are alive in Christ, and so that we are to fix our eyes, our energy, our attention, our affections on things above. Christ is above. He is the giver of life. And uh, as a result, then there are certain things, activities, thought processes that we need to rid ourselves of, like uh, old, dirty garments. And then there are other things that we need to put on. So you don't just get to take off and just uh, walk around unclothed. You take off and then you put on. And that's... That's the argument that the Apostle Paul is doing here. Today, in this and in the coming weeks, we will examine more closely what it means to take off old garments and put on new garments, and what it means to be dead to the world at the same time being alive in Christ. So we're going to go back through certain uh, verses of the, of the 17 verses we read, and we are going to zero in on them and, and examine them more closely so that we can begin to pattern our lives to the teachings of the Scriptures. There is a war going on concerning two elemental things about the Scriptures. One is its authority, meaning that it has the power, it has the ranking system, the, the ranking or the authority to dictate how we are supposed to live. Number two is the sufficiency of, Chris, of, of the Scriptures, which means that the Scriptures and what it dictates concerning how we are to live, how we are to speak, how we are to act, how we are to engage with one another and our relationship with Christ is sufficient for life. You actually do not need anything else except to see life through the lenses of Scripture. 
So today we will do that by examining specifically Colossians 3 and 5. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, O God, for the opportunity to open up your word. And we ask, O God, that you would illuminate our hearts that we may be able to be to not only hear and understand, but we would be transformed by your word, O God, so that we can become more closely aligned, that we may be, we may resemble more closely the master who has purchased us with his own blood. Remove me, O God, out of the equation and allow me to learn from you like everybody else. Hide me behind the shadow of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. So Colossians 3, 5, if you can follow along with me, it says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So the apostle now begins a list, and this is a very partial list, and he's going to do this this kind of play of vices and virtues type of comparison. And we start here with some very predominant, predominant, vices that were surrounding the Colossian church. It was part of the culture at large. And considering that the members of the Colossian church came from the culture in which they lived in, it was imperative that they understood that when you cross over from death to life, there are certain things that live people do. And don't do. And so because they're alive now in Christ, he says that they are to consider the members of their bodies as dead. This idea of putting to death in the Greek vernacular is a a command that insists on a decisive action. It is actually something that you do. Now, arguably, it is not something that you do in your own power, but it is still something that you do. You do not get to passively receive from the Lord without doing something. In fact, uh, uh, the Lord gave this parable about the talents. Remember that parable? And what happened to the one guy that he gave that one talent and all he did was bury it? He was rebuked for it. There's something that you must... Now, the talent was not his. He didn't have to come up with the talent. The talent was given to him. So you have been given something and you must do something with the something you've been given. So this is a command. It is a decisive action. And the command is so strong in the Greek that instead of translating it, uh, the exact words, let's go ahead and just translate the connotation, the idea, the thought inspired by those words. The, The message there then would likely read like this. Mortify it. Do it now. Do it resolutely. It is that strong of a command. And like I was saying to another brother in Christ, you cannot do what only God can do. But God will not do what he commanded you to do. Because if he has commanded you, he has empowered you. That is the reason why he was so angry with Moses. When he told Moses, go to the Egyptian, 
and tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses came up with every excuse as to why he couldn't do that. I have a, 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 a stuttering problem. Oh, really? Who gave you your mouth? God said. Don't tell me what you can't do. I'm the one sending you. It is an insult. And so he says, mortify it. Mortify the flesh. Start doing it right now. And of course, God has already done the big work in which the sins of the world were nailed to the cross. But Christians are to know this. They ought to count on it as true and they ought to act accordingly. There must be a conscious effort to slay the remaining sin that is in your flesh. You will always have this and you must always slay it. You don't get this. You will always have this and you must always slay it. Until the day that our Lord and Savior bust through those clouds and when you see him, you, are, you now become like him and this mortal body will, be, will, will put on immortality until that day you continue to slay. Romans 8, 13 says, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. Because if you are living according to the flesh, then you have not taken on the the body of, you have not taken on the the nature of Christ. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death, you see the, the continuous, the progressive, if by the Spirit you are putting to death, it's a daily thing for some of us, it's an hourly thing or a minute by minute thing. If by the Spirit you are putting to death the practices of the body, you will live. For as many as being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So when you are daily walking, killing some things, slaying some things, it is evident that the Spirit lives in you and you will live. If you are living according to the flesh, you have not the Spirit of God. And without the Spirit of God, you will die. But if you have received the Spirit of God, you will live. This is a fight which you are never to get tired of. I I can't stress that enough. The, The Bible says, do not grow weary in well doing. You are never to get tired of doing this. And this is the reason why God has put together different members within the same body so that when you are getting a whiff of of burdensome, of, of, of tiredness, you can go to your brother and say, I am tired. And your brother can open up the scriptures to you and begin reading and 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 and, and strengthening you and 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 praying over you that your spirit may be refreshed 
so that you can go back to slaying your flesh. That's the purpose for having brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's the reason why you are not to walk this walk in isolation. Oh, Satan loves when Christians walk alone. So he can whisper lies to you. You are not to get tired. And let me, add, let, me, let me add this. None of us have the right to give up because none of us have gotten to the place where it is too much. It don't matter how much you think you have gotten there. Look at what Hebrews 12, 4, it says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. We live in a time and a place where we can come to church and sit in padded seats and, and enjoy air conditioning. We have not been called to resist unto the point to where you are killed, where you are tortured. We are in a battle for sure, but we are not in the ticket of the battle, not in this society, not yet. Anyway, it may come, but that's not today. My brother, you all know I'm from Panama. My, my brother used to watch Abram and Sarai and say to me, your children are soft. And I said to him, I said, they're Americans. What do you expect? They have no idea what it is to play soccer in 100 degree weather. They don't know what that is. They don't know about mosquitoes. They don't, I mean, at the slightest ouch requires an entire box of, of, of um, what is it? Band-Aids, the whole box for one, for one little tiny minuscule cut. Yeah, my brother was like, ah, they're so soft. And in many ways, as Christians in this society, we are so soft. We are not, we have not gotten to the place where it takes so much to resist to the point where you are shedding blood. But if we want to keep ourselves from sexual immorality, impurities, passions, evil desires, and greed, then we have to decide whether or not we will keep our life or lose it for Christ. That's the decision. And, 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 and for some of us, if I was to say, okay, how many of you will give up your life for Christ? And, and, and probably all of you would raise your hand. But I'm going to tell you the truth. The Bible is really, really, really true. He who is faithful in little things, if you won't give up your immoral life for Christ, you certainly won't give up your life. If you won't give up your favorite sin for Christ, then as soon as somebody puts a gun to your head, you will renounce Christ. You don't become the strongest Christian in the most heinous of circumstances by being the weakest of Christians in the most favorable circumstances. So he says to put to death, put it to death, consider your members of your earthly body dead 
And let's go ahead and look at those things one by one. He starts with sexual immorality. And what does the, what, what does the, world, the word sexual immorality, and for us it's, it's, it's two words, but the word here in the Hebrew is porneia. And porneia, or porneia, is where we get um, our English word for pornography. Now, in, the, in, in, in our vernacular, in our culture, pornography, or as, at least the way the dictionary defines it, as a printed or visual material containing the explicit description or display of sexual organs or activity intended to stimulate erotic rather than aesthetic emotional feelings. That's our English definition. However, in the scriptures, pornea is somewhat of a catch-all phrase or catch-all word, if you will. It denotes adultery. It denotes fornication. It denotes homosexuality. It denotes lesbianism. It denotes uh, 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 sexual activity with an animal, sexual activity with close relatives, sexual activity with, uh, uh, between divorced people. Basically, is any and all sexual activity that is conducted outside the band of marriage, the bond of marriage, and that marriage between male and female. It's all of it. Consider the following passage. In Ephesians 5, 3, but sexual immorality or pornea or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Meaning not even a hint of this type of behavior should be found among us. Not even a hint. Everything that has to do with sexual activity outside of marriage. He's saying your body needs to be dead to that. Not even a hint. Which brings us to the next word which is impurity. It's so funny because now he goes from the actual activity, which is something that the Jews understood. They're like, okay, I won't engage. But in the recesses of my own mind, I can do whatever I want because nobody can see that. And so then Paul now covers that with the word akatarsia, which goes beyond acts of sexual sin to encompass evil thoughts and intentions as well. Huh. He didn't give us an out. There are no loopholes here. Not only can you or you are not supposed to engage in certain activities, you are not supposed to dwell in the mental exercise of such activities. That is the reason why I personally do not recommend long engagements or long courtship processes. If you are not thinking in concepts of getting married, you have no business dating. Oh yeah, that's not popular. But I'm coming down your street anyway. <laughs> if you have no concept of I'm going to get married to this person, why in the world are you flirting with temptation?
Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 8. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I am. Meaning it's okay to be single. But if they do not have self-control, meaning you can't keep your hands to yourself, you can't keep your thoughts to yourself about yourself and not include other people that they don't even know they're in your mind that way. Then he says, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion, which is the impurities. Yeah, if you're not... Why do we let our children have girlfriends and boyfriends at 15 and 16? Ain't nobody getting married. What do you think that does? You're sitting next to each other every day, holding hands, kissing on each other for weeks and months. I guarantee you that if you're not having sex, you are at least having the thoughts. God wired us this way. It's not a bad thing, but it needs to be used correctly. Fire is a wonderful thing in the fireplace. No, but I'm guilty of it too. I told my children, no boyfriend, no girlfriend until 16. What does that mean? Because certainly they couldn't walk around hugged up against each other in front of me. What is the purpose? All you're doing is flirting with sin. Sooner or later it's going to happen. And heaven forbid you bring a child into this world now with a person you have never committed yourself to. And then we do this thing where we... We, we cohabitate, right? Like a car. Let me take it on a test drive first before I buy. Let me taste the, the milk first before I buy this cow and make sure that the milk is good. It doesn't work. First of all, you are living outside of Scripture. Second of all, it has proven by Countless surveys that, and studies that the cohabitation does not work. There is a, there is a, a best-selling author and marriage and family therapist by the name of uh, Ron Deal. This, this is what he had to say. This was interesting when I read this. He says that this is normally what happens with co cohabitating couples. They increase their risk of divorce by 50% when and if they get married. They tend to value their independence rather than their interdependent relationship. He says, you can't test a relationship by sitting on the side of the pool and dipping your toe in the shallow end. You have to jump into the deep end to know whether or not you can really swim. He says, they are less sexually trustworthy. They tend to have negative attitudes about marriage. They have lower religious commitments. 
Sometimes they exchange intentional dating for the pseudo security of being together. They break up at a rate of 50% before marriage. Have lower marital quality and commitment if they do get married compared to couples who did not cohabitate before marriage. They are tempted to slide into marriage. We're living together and sharing a bus pass, so why not get hitched? Instead of making a conscious decision to throw their entire lives into marriage. It doesn't work. But I prefer, rather than to listen to the experts that already agree with the scriptures, just follow the scriptures. Just follow the scriptures. The Bible says don't do it. The truth of the matter is that you are not commanded by the Bible to marry the person you love. There is no commandment in the scriptures that says you must marry the person you love. What it does command you to do is to love the person you marry. So if you don't believe you can marry this person, if you don't believe, sorry, that you cannot love this person, then let them go. Not after you got married to them, though. <laughs> this is important. You are dating as a young woman, as a as a woman, you are dating and you are looking for that companion you have, you, you know, that, that, that mate. And I understand that this is a, a 20th, 21st century notion, okay? Because for the rest of earth history, parents chose. I'm just saying, it worked for thousands of years. And last few hundred years, that's not what we do. We need to feel <laughs> Cupid. The, the Greco-Roman lie. I'm so in love with you. What is that? It really does not exist. You are dating to see if this person is compatible with you. And the rules of compatibility are in the scriptures. If this person is not a believer, he is incompatible with you. After that, you get to choose. And if you choose that this guy you're dating is way too stupid for you to marry him, let him go. Don't stay in that relationship. If you determine early, this woman will send me bankrupt. I can't stand it. Okay, let her go. Don't keep holding hands and, and licking each other's faces. What do you think is going to happen? And all of this is so common sense. It is so common sense. So the apostle adds impurity, pathos, which means passion, lustful, and epithemia, evil desires, which is lustful craving. All of that stuff is wrapped up. It has to do with the mind. And all he's doing is regurgitating what Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that everyone, any, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is simply not okay for us. And we should not let our children think it is okay for them. I know, 
I know. Every television show out there, every last one of them. All of the books that are even assigned reading in our high schools and in our middle schools promote exactly what the Bible calls as sinful. It's not popular. And when you confront your children with this, there's going to inevitably be friction between you and them. I, I, I made a decision some time ago. I want so badly, desire so badly for the salvation of my children. But I know that ultimately it has to be the work of God in their hearts. But what will not happen is for me to have to answer for their sins. Because I didn't teach them right. Because I didn't tell them, don't do that. Simply because I wanted my approval rating among my children to go up. The last thing on this short list of vices is greed. Pleonexia, which is the insatiable desire to gain more and more, especially of things that are forbidden. And if you notice, all of this stuff is related. Exodus 20, 17, we get the mandate already from the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male slave or his female slave or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And you know how we like to read our scriptures. It doesn't mean I can't covet his car. It doesn't say car. This is an attitude or a bent of the heart before. It is the bent of the heart before the hands actually do it. It is the bent of the heart before you steal or before you engage in, in, in sexually with somebody else's spouse. And please get this. Oh my goodness, get this. If you're engaging in any kind of sexual relationship with, some, with, with somebody who's not your spouse, then you are engaging in sexual relationship with somebody else's spouse. They may not be married today, but when they get married tomorrow, you have already defiled them today. Do you get this? Oh, the apostle is, he's jabbing that thing, that knife in, because it is important that we who are alive in Christ do not act like the dead folks. So the whole greed, don't do it. Don't allow your mind to bend on, in that direction. Fight that. Do not engage in it. My, 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 my uh, mentor, I remember telling him when I was a young man, i like, I can't help myself but to have dirty thoughts. I try, I can't stop. And he said to me, Antonio, you perhaps cannot stop a bird from flying over your head, but you certainly can stop it from nesting on it. And I wanted to have a witty comeback, but I couldn't. <laughs> because the thoughts that I was talking about were not fleeting. They were nests that I had allowed. When people engage 
in either greed or sexual sins. The apostle has cataloged these in the sense that he's saying they are following their desires rather than God's desires. So in essence, they are worshiping themselves. And that is idolatry. You don't need a wooden, I don't know, mannequin to bow down to it for you to be engaged in idolatry. All you have to do is follow your own desires. And according to the scriptures, you are already involved in idolatry. And the desires start with the mind. And once Satan has won over your mind, it's like a wind-up toy. He, has to, he doesn't have to do anything else. The Bible says that when Eve saw that the fruit was good for food and desirable to gain understanding, if you notice, the devil had not one more word to say. She has already been wind up and all you got to do is put her down and watch the toy go. Because it starts in your mind. And in the mind is what gives the devil a, foot, a footstool. Ephesians 4.27 says, do not give the devil an opportunity. Mean re, meaning you, you rebuke the thought as it comes. If you don't remember anything I say here today, remember this. Do not be deceived. Every sin committed by human hands has its roots firmly planted in the human mind. To stop doing wrong, it is imperative to stop thinking wrongly. Which is the reason why the Bible says that you need to not conform to the patterns of this world, but to you to be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Your mind. How you think, how you reason. My biggest fight with the teenagers I still have at home is that I am not as interested in what they do as I am interested in how they think. Because their thought processes will dictate what they do. If I can get them to think righteously, then they will act righteously. Whether I'm watching them or not. If I only deal with their actions, they will act righteously when they're in front of me just because they don't want to get in trouble. But as soon as I am not there, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so the apostle starts with the actions and ends with the intentions, at least in this, in this passage, ends with the intentions of the mind. But it all really starts from the mind that follows what the actions are. And you know that sin, when fully developed, leads to death. And he reminds the Colossians in verses 6 and 7, that on the account of these things, all of the things I have mentioned, all these vices that I have mentioned, which is how dead people live, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them, living in your death, the real 
living, walking dead. As the praise team comes, taking literally, putting anything to death can seem harsh. But modern medicine does have the understanding that putting something to death can lead to life. Consider chemotherapy for cancer. The body is dosed in radiation treatment with the expectation that the chemo will kill the cancer cells, thereby granting life to the body. Sometimes to truly experience life with God, something must die. The devil will try to convince you that you cannot do this. And this is all I have truth, which is how the devil speaks. In your own power, it is indeed impossible. But 2 Peter 1.3 tells us that, is, that his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. You have it. It's in you. Also remember that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Satan is the master deceiver. And he will twist our master's words. Make you think that you cannot do that which God has empowered you to do. And then make you think that you can affect the things that can only be done by God. Just upside down. If you surrender your life to Christ, I guarantee you that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. There was a time in my life after surrendering to Christ when I found myself in sin. I was in my late teens, early 20s. And I thought to myself, this heaven thing must not be for me. Because I cannot stop sinning. Do you know that I actually uttered the words and I said to the Lord, just let me be. This is not for me. Obviously, I cannot live the way you want me to live. And with that, I thought I had made my peace with God and Considered that to have been my last prayer. And then I was shocked. Why is he still calling me? I don't get it. I still felt horrible about engaging in sin. And then I started to study more. And I discovered the scriptures that said, even when we are unfaithful, <laughs> he remains faithful. Even when we will break every promise we've ever made, he will honor every promise he ever made. And since he had begun a good work with me and in me, it didn't matter what I said. And so I turned around and apprehended that which apprehended me first. As he whispers, you didn't love me. 
but I loved you. And I am transforming you from the inside out. Put to death your flesh every day and be conformed, be transformed into his image. Amen.